Amphibians are a topic that I find fascinating. They're a really unusual class of animals. Um, they're very beneficial to us, but I think a lot of times they kind of don't um, get the attention that some of those glamorous species like tigers, like um, gorillas, for example, might get. Um, but they are something that's right here in our community, something I think we should be aware of, especially because they have been the victim of a huge, huge decline. So I used to kind of, or I used to title this program the good, the bad, and the slimy, because <laughs> there really is a lot of good about this group. They do quite a bit of good for us. The bad is really what happens to them. Unfortunately, they're in a bad situation right now. And the slimy, just because that gives us a good intro into their basic characteristics. So um, one question I do like to put out there before we really start, especially if I'm talking to somebody who's of a generation before or even two generations before me, is did you hear frogs a lot more when you were a child versus now? And most people tell me, yes, absolutely. They remember going out at night, hearing frogs calling frequently, maybe finding them, chasing them, you know, their calls, catching them then. And, you know, there's a good reason for that. They have declined dramatically. I'll give you some stats on that in a little bit. Um, but I want to start talking a little bit about those basic characteristics. And I really gave you the first one which is pretty obvious from this picture. And I am going to use a lot of local examples, things that you may see outside in wetlands near where you live, or maybe ones that you've seen growing up. So amphibian means that they have a dual life. They're going to spend that life at least partially in water, maybe partially on land. You'll see there's always exceptions to the rules, um, but I like to use my bullfrog right here as an example. That's one of the larger frogs you're going to be seeing out around in your, our local environment. So first and foremost, I said kind of slimy. And you can kind of see from this picture, aside from just being in a pond, being all wet, they do look like they would be slippery. <laughs> and if you ever remember picking one up at any point in your life, they're hard to hold onto. They're covered in what is actually a kind of mucus, but it keeps their skin safe. We're gonna talk a little bit more about why their skin is so important to their survival, but let's just put that out there. They all have some kind of slimy covering. Uh, they actually do breathe through their skin. So that mucus is there partially for protection with that. Um, they are egg layers, which you can see to the side of our bullfrog right here. So let's presume this is mom, <laughs> but they do lay their eggs typically in water. That's one reason amphibians need to be by water, at least at some point in their life. Um, backbones are no backbones. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to think of that since they don't quite have the same shape we do, but they do have a backbone. They are considered vertebrates and there are no exceptions to that rule. Cold or warm blooded. I always say that the um, thing to think of, if you're trying to kind of figure out if something is warm or cold blooded, if it's cold blooded, you're not really gonna see it in the winter. And we definitely don't see these hopping around during snowstorms. During that time, they're kind of hunkered down doing a <clears throat> kind of a version of hibernation. So they are definitely cold blooded. That's why they come out, they breed in the spring, they're out in our warm summer months. And they do have stages of development. I am sure maybe as kids, you caught them as little tadpoles and watched them grow up and change and almost become this completely different animal from the time you see them hatch to the time they grow up. So they do go through that whole life cycle, which we'll talk about again um, as to why it's so important. And then generally, they have something we call sexual dimorphism, which just means the, the sexes are different sizes. And in this case, it is almost always the case that females are larger than the males, and sometimes in a pretty dramatic fashion. So we do see that with humans. Generally, men are a little bit larger than females, but not always. So um, with amphibians, you do tend to see that. So going on to our next one, I want to talk about what types of amphibians are out there. And there are four examples of ones we might see right around here. So I would typically put our local amphibians into four groups. Frogs, like that American bullfrog again, up in the upper left. An American toad, the one on the upper right. And you can really see a difference between those two. That one on the left has that visibly smoother, slimier, shiny skin. Whereas that one on the right looks drier and bumpier. So that's one of the big differences. Toads are going to spend more of their time on land versus bullfrogs spending more time in water. 
typically that's the difference between the two. We do have some toads that even live in desert environments who might only come up to the surface maybe once or twice a year when it rains. Down on the left, you might recognize a spotted salamander. Those as adults are mostly living on land. So think of them a little bit like the toads in that sense, even though they tend to have that nice slimy kind of smooth skin. And then on the bottom right is an Eastern red spotted newt. So they're actually gonna look a little bit different, different shades throughout their life stages. But I think we all recognize what we call a red F in that stage where they're that nice bright orange color. And as adults, they're usually semi-aquatic to aquatic. So there's really a range of habitats that they are all in, but all of these need access to fresh water at some point in their life cycle. So you're gonna notice looking at those four, all four of those have four limbs but that is not the universal type of form, even for an amphibian. I'm gonna show you a couple differences to the general rule. On that left, you see what looks like a worm crawling around on the ground, and that is a really unusual amphibian called a cassilian. And um, it is easy to mistake for a worm because they do pretty much go underground, spend most of their time underground, do many of those same um, jobs as a worm, aerating the soil, moving through, However, um, they are completely limbless. They, are, they have all those other characteristics though. They are sort of slimy. They've got that backbone. Uh, they're typically found in South and Central America, um, but you do have some species also in Africa and Asia. So they're pretty much, they're pretty widespread, except not so much here in North America. And on the right is something called a siren. And if you look carefully at it, I do see tiny front legs, but no back legs. So our amphibians can really have zero legs. They can have two, they can have four. So there's actually a little bit more diversity than most people think. So those sirens typically are aquatic, although you can see in this picture, they are at least on partially dry land at the moment. And those we do find in North America, but only towards the Southern half of the US. So I've shown you a couple different types of amphibian, and I just wanna show you again, a little more variety. So there's a huge variety in size with amphibians. Um, when we're thinking of the biggest one of all, I know a lot of people think of bullfrogs or maybe they've seen those great big um, African bullfrogs, which can get quite, quite large. However, the biggest amphibian of all is this guy right here. That is a Chinese giant salamander. It's hard to see perspective with that picture, but that guy would be about 55 to 66 pounds. They typically average out. Um, between three and a half to four feet, typically, so quite large. Now, to give you a little perspective, there they are in the arms of your average human. <laughs> so um, you can see they're very, very large. There is a very similar species in Japan, almost the same size, and those two would be our largest salamander species and altogether our largest amphibian species. We do have a pretty large salamander that I will talk about a few slides down called a hellbender they would be the largest salamander in our area, or at least in North America. But going back to frogs for a minute, this guy would be our largest species of frog called an African Goliath frog. You can kind of see perspective too with those hands. They can get, there's a big wide range for those. So some of the smaller ones may only be about two pounds, but some of the bigger ones can get to be about seven pounds, pretty substantial, roughly seven to 13 inches, a uh, very large type of frog. As I said, though, remember the females will be the larger ones of the species. Um, one thing that frogs do that you've probably seen if you've ever picked one up is to puff themselves up to try to make themselves look a little bit larger, a little bit harder to hold on to. So if this guy was puffed up, they do have that round appearance. It'd be very difficult to <laughs> capture, for example. So around here, I did mention the biggest frog we're probably going to find would be an American bullfrog. They have very, very large tadpoles, very different, um, much larger than most. This picture that I'm going to show you is an atypical one, a little bit larger whoops, than we would normally see, but that is an example of an extremely large bullfrog tadpole. They're typically only up to about eight inches long, maybe one pound, but still when you think about most amphibians, that's pretty large. 
One thing that I find interesting about them is that they actually have a two year developmental cycle, or, or at least two years to develop from tadpoles to an adult. We're pretty used to the frogs around here laying their eggs, developing, and going through all of those stages within usually just a couple of weeks. This one actually takes two years. So it's going to hatch, it's going to exist in this tadpole form, very much like that picture, um, for months. And when that first winter hits, they will go under the mud, like many other amphibians do to wait out that winter and really continue developing that following spring when they'll be an adult. So it's a lot longer than most of the animals or most of the amphibians that we're used to. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we've got tiny. So this is our smallest known amphibian. And I say known because when you're that tiny, it's easy to avoid being discovered. This one was only discovered in 2012. Uh, it has, doesn't really have a common name yet, so I'll give you the Latin name. It's a pedophyrene amoensis. And they're from Papua New Guinea. That's a full grown one right there next to the penny for scale. And they are considered not just the smallest amphibian species, but the world's smallest known vertebrate. So having that same skeletal system as the big ones, just in extremely, extremely tiny form. So I'm gonna go a little further back now to our geological time scale, something we talk about appendixy all the time. So thank you to National Geographic for giving us a nice colorful one right here. So when we talk about when amphibians started to develop, going back these, over 4 billion years that we know life has been on Earth, we're going to go back to the end of the Devonian, the start of the Carboniferous. So right below the middle, you'll see a tan stripe that says Devonian. And that's when those first, um, I'll say the predecessors of amphibians started to develop. The, we definitely started to see them in the Carboniferous. And again, we are, as humans, just coming onto the scene in that second stripe from the top. So they have been here a whole lot longer than we have. And um, just to give you an idea too, of what these early proto amphibians and early amphibians looked like, we have this guy, which really looks like a fish, right? And technically it is, it's called a lobe finned fish. And they're an evolutionary connection between fish and amphibians. So sort of a common ancestor. The next one you might recognize pictures of. There's a lot of um, a lot of funny memes online with this guy, unfortunately. So called Tiktaalik, and they originally thought maybe it was an immediate predecessor to amphibians. Now, with a little bit more research, we know it's a transition fossil. We know it is one branch between fish and amphibians that maybe died off before it could be an amphibian. We do have a lot of transitional fossils that maybe went in directions, but then eventually died off. But you'll notice in this one, he's sort of holding himself up a little bit more so on those front fins. Back fins still are extremely fish-like. And then we have a little bit more progression. We have this Acanthostega, which um, again, doesn't quite look fish-like, doesn't quite look salamander-like, but it's starting to get that image. If you look though, um, the back legs are a little bit more developed. This is the first one that has what we call a pelvic girdle or really a really well-developed hips so that it's able to actually support itself a little bit more so on those back legs instead of just dragging around on the front ones. So when scientists look at these transitional fossils, they compare the same bones across those different species to see how they've evolved and shifted. So this picture just shows you those three that I just showed you and where those bones have moved to allow these animals to move up onto land just a little bit easier. So the earliest known amphibian that we know of today at least is this one right here. So we call it an Elgonopteron and they were about 368 million years ago, the late Devonian. So if you've never been to Penn Dixie, where we work, um, we are a fossil park that has a level exposed from the Devonian. Unfortunately, these amphibians developed probably 10 to 12 million years after our fossils. So as of today, we have not yet 
found any amphibian fossils at Pendixie, but we are looking at the same period of time. Pendixie fossils are typically about 380, 382 million. And again, this one's about 368. So now that you've had your background, why are amphibians so important? I mean, we don't see them every day. We may not interact with them every day, so we may not think of them every day. But they are incredibly important as a bioindicator. So a bioindicator is any living thing that is going to reflect the condition of the environment around it. So in the case of an amphibian, because they absorb oxygen through their skin, they breathe through their skin, they're going to be affected by pollution very, very early. Usually they're the first in their ecosystem to basically let us know that something is not right. Pollution affects them um, very dramatically. Disease affects them dramatically. So if you start to see your amphibians declining, that's a big sign something is off, some sign to us that we really need to turn it around, you know, before it affects us, before it affects other species, and to, of course, save those amphibians. So just as examples, um, we see mass amounts die off. The picture on the left is actually due to a disease I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. But even pollution might cause mutations like that center picture right there. You see it much more so. And then because they are in an aquatic ecosystem, they're really affected at all stages of development. So that brings their numbers down a little bit, um, a little bit more dramatically. And scientists really started seeing that decline in the 1950s. So they classified it as a modern day mass extinction right around the 1980s. So it's been happening for quite an amount of time. Unfortunately, it's really sort of accelerated for a few reasons. Um, they're also important because they are a vital part of the food chain, the food web. Um, and that's even more so for amphibians because part of that life is in water, part is on land. So those amphibians are incredibly important at controlling aller algae overload, um, microorganisms, think about something like mosquito larvae. We want them to eat those kind of things in the water. Uh, when they get up on land, again, eating things that may be pests to us, things again, the adult mosquitoes. We like amphibians because they hit those mosquitoes at all stages of life. Um, and I know you're thinking, it, frogs eating mice, but bullfrogs will eat anything that they can fit in their mouth. So um, bullfrogs will eat other frogs, they will eat snakes, they will eat bugs, fish, and mice. And, you know, it is, they benefit the ecosystem overall, um, just controlling a lot of things that we really don't want to get out of control, like I was saying. So they are also not just consumers, but they get consumed by many other things. These are all creatures in our own local ecosystem that would eat them. That's a milk snake on the one side, skunks, of course, a great blue heron and red-tailed hawk, and on our plates as well. So you may have tried frog legs at some point. I have not. I can't tell you if they taste like chicken. Uh, but they are an important food source for many, many diverse groups, including ourselves. Now, why are they declining? You can probably guess at that number one reason, and that is us. That would be our population. Think of how much we started to see that decline in the 50s. Think of how much our human population has increased since then and how much um, land has been taken over by us. So we've crowded them out of their natural habitat. We've changed their natural habitat, removed it in many cases. And one thing we don't always think about is fragmenting it which just basically means chopping it up. So they may not be able to access parts of their original habitat because there's a road across it, or there could be a building, there could be a bridge that you know, impacts them in some way. So um, population, definitely a big thing, but as I started to talk about before, pollution. So that is a picture of the Buffalo River flowing into Lake Erie in the 1970s. But that lighter band that you see there is a direct runoff right from a factory right into the lake. Fortunately, you know, we've cleaned up some of our standards in terms of what we will allow being dumped directly now, but um, the damage does cause a huge, huge decline. And then the third one, which I started to kind of allude to before, is something called chytrid fungus. 
And it's actually a disease that impacts amphibians dramatically. That little die off right there was due to an outbreak of this disease. So, this, back, this chytrid fungus, which is an easier way of saying that bull name, which I think I will not butcher today, um, is something that has cropped up roughly in that same amount of time that we've seen this um, seen this major decline. However, um, most of it, I would say within the last 20 years or so more dramatically. Um, they discovered it in 1998. Um, they are, there's a lot of suggested origins for it, but we don't know for sure. Some say Africa, some say Asia, but we really do not know, um, especially since most of the impact has actually been felt in the Americas. So what actually happens when an animal, when one of these amphibians contracts this, is that this fungus attacks the keratin in the skin. Uh, we have keratin in our skin and our hair. It's a basic building block for a lot of creatures. Um, but in the case of amphibians, it causes it to thicken. And I've already mentioned that they get a lot of water. They transfer directly into and out of their skin. So when that's thickened, they're unable to balance salt and water levels, which eventually causes heart failure. Um, think of how bad that would be if you had to drink salt water and had no way to process it through your body and excrete it. That's basically an equivalent to what they have to go through. And this fungus is probably spread through direct contact or contaminated water. It does look like some animals can be um, carriers, but not die off so much. Bullfrogs are one example of that. So they can carry it. Um, it may not affect their species directly, but it's of course in the water around them and any other amphibians that are nearby. Um, they think that it may have originated possibly from the trade of a small frog, which you would see in any pet store today called an African clawed frog. They were heavily um, trapped and used for um, medical research around the 1950s and 60s, but um, the trade of those may have actually helped spread it around. So over this time, it has been estimated to cause the decline of about 501 amphibian species, and that makes up about 6.5% of all amphibians. Uh, roughly 8,000 species currently exist on our planet. Um, the oldest, oldest strain that they've seen looks like it was dates back to about 1863, but that was before they discovered what this fungus was. They've actually been able to kind of look back and then define it a little bit based on what we know now. So in that little graphic there, you can see that South America, Central America have been impacted pretty heavily. Uh, large extinctions in Central America and Oceania, which would be the islands in the South Pacific, that area. I am not sure. I was asked before why this graphic does not include Asia as a separate area. I'm not entirely sure. It may be that it has happened there, but not in the same levels. But um, it does go through most of the rest of the geography of where this happens. So these bad things happen, but I don't want you to have a hopeless kind of feeling about this. There are a lot of small and large things we can do to help these animals. The number one thing is educate yourself. And that is exactly what you're doing right now. So the more you know about it, the more you can be conscious of those choices that we make that may impact things negatively. So if you, um, you might learn what pesticides are more dangerous and you know reduce them or not use them. So there are safer ones to use. In general, it's a great idea to conserve water. Um, when we have a lot of excess runoff, it tends to pick up things like pesticides, like chemicals and go into the groundwater, which is not good for us or for any of our aquatic species, fish, amphibians. Rain barrels are a really nice example of that. I had to put those in the center because they do help us to prevent excess runoff and to use less, um, to reuse the water that comes down as rain. Um, toad abodes, which are those two little things on the right hand side. We see a toad sitting inside of a homemade one, which is really just a flower pot kind of anchored into the earth. And we can, of course, buy a nice fancy store store made one if we'd like. Um, but it's a nice way to give some protection to these toads that do live in our yards and do eat the insects that 
um, might affect our gardens, eating slugs, we like them to be there. So we want to give them reasons to hunker down, to stay there. Uh, it's a good idea to put out some fresh water for them as well. Um, just as a reminder, you do want it to not have chlorine in it. So it's a good idea if you do set little water dishes out for these animals, let them sit, let the chlorine dissipate before putting it out in your yard. And then it's typically pretty safe. Um, and then on a bigger scale, we really need to change some of the laws that protect our wild lands. So, I mean, the Clean Water Act is a great step. Um, definitely vote, have a say in you know, what happens where you live. Um, I can always send along a, gift, a list of some suggested actions too, if you're interested in anything beyond that. <clears throat> so I do wanna highlight, excuse me, <coughs> A lot of talking. <laughs> uh, I do want to highlight a couple local projects that have been done to help some of our amphibian neighbors. So you can take part if you've ever heard of citizen science. It is a project that allows everyday people like us to contribute to research. <clears throat> so there is one called Frog Watch USA. I would really love to start up a chapter at Penn Dixie, so keep your eyes open. That may happen next year. That was started in 1998 and initially was organized through the American Zoological Association. Right now, I believe it is being run through one very specific US zoo, um, but if you look through the AZA to find information about it, it will direct you there. So more than 141 organizations currently participate, some of which are zoos and aquariums, some of which could be nature centers or even just organized interested groups. And they've collected data from every single state since 1998. What it really does is <clears throat> send people out to learn about what frogs are in your community and then do some observations for a couple weeks in spring when our frogs are at their most vocal, um, recording what we hear out there, where they're located, <clears throat> where some successful breeding grounds might be. And that's really just by recording calls or sightings. So that little bit of information that you can do actually does help to have us estimate how large the population is. And then another through your local zoo at the, at, um, the Buffalo Zoo, <coughs> excuse me, for many years, they've been doing something called the Puerto Rican Crested Toad Recovery Plan. So this amphibian native to Puerto Rico while you might be familiar with the coqui and other um, important frogs that live down there, this is actually the only toad species on, on the island. And they were actually the first amphibian to be protected under what's called a species survival plan. So zoos basically band together and plan breeding for these animals. So between 82 and 92, four zoos started it up, Buffalo, Fort Worth, Juan Rivera, which is in Puerto Rico and Toronto. And they bred and successfully reintroduced a couple thousand toads to Puerto Rico. But every year since then, they have been expanding and releasing hundreds of thousands of tadpoles. So while this hasn't necessarily fixed the problem of the decline, it is helping to slow it. So if you can basically um, keep the species at a higher level, and make those changes in cleaner water or reserved areas for them, there is a little bit more hope that this species would not go extinct. And then a more local species, which I mentioned before, is the hellbender. And I said they are the largest salamander in North America. We don't have them immediately as our neighbors, but just a little bit south of here in the Allegheny region, out down into the Midwest, we do see them. And again, third largest salamander in the world, largest here in the US, and about 80% of the population has been lost or is declining due to water pollution, habitat destruction, and overall climate change. So it does look a little bit like those very large salamanders I showed you in the beginning, but I'm gonna show you a couple pictures of this Head Start project. So there's many, many steps involved. There um, at the Buffalo Zoo, for example, was one one um, zoo that did this project. They collected various eggs from the wild. Then I think they started out with somewhere around 800 and then individually put them in these very climate controlled um, cups, <laughs> basically, where the water was changed out very frequently. Um, maybe not 800 hatchlings came about, but 
quite a few hundred there. You see it right at the size of hatching. So I believe that is a teaspoon and start off extremely tiny, not looking like a whole lot, but then um, raising them under very, very controlled conditions until they are at a stage that's not quite so vulnerable. That was the idea with this project, getting them um, through those most vulnerable stages, both to pollution and predators, so that they could be tagged, for example, in that picture in the middle, and then re-released into the wild. So a bunch of them were taken by the DEC, our local DEC here, as well as the Roger Tory Peterson Institute in Jamestown. Um, in terms of whether or not this has been successful, I think it hasn't quite played out long enough, but they do continue to track and see how many of these salamanders do survive out in the wild. I think it's definitely worth um, the attempt, if nothing else. So it'll be an interesting project to see moving forward how much that does actually impact. On a larger scale initiative, we have a bunch of groups that have combined to do what is called an amphibian arc, and that's basically exactly what it sounds like. They select species that would otherwise go extinct um, to be maintained in captivity until they can have a secure place in the wild. So they may be secured in large facilities. There's one in Costa Rica that's quite large, various museums, zoos, universities, and um, it's almost a little holding pattern until hopefully their local ecosystem is able to sustain them again, just to avoid overall extinction. So again, it's easy to become discouraged hearing about how much these are declining, um, but there's a lot of interesting things about these animals, um, definitely worth saving. And just to kind of, on a fun note, I like to show you a couple of the amphib amphibian oddities, the things that make, that really showcase how interesting of a group they are. So I kind of call my next pages, you know, what is happening here? <laughs> so I like to use this one as one of my more interesting amphibian exceptions. And when you look at this nice little green frog, he looks incredibly typical, um, just sitting there in the duckweed. So what is so unusual about this frog? He is something called a paradox frog and, or a paradoxical frog. And if you, you know, a paradox is something that doesn't truly make sense. So the thing that is so unusual about this one is that this is our only known animal whose offspring is larger than the adult. That's really, really a strange concept when you think about it. So just for example here, these are uh, wax models, but they were taken from you know, the original specimens. So the adult you see on the right and the tadpole is this enormous bulky looking thing. So they do lay their eggs and they go, undergo a huge amount of growth in those eggs. One reason that those eggs are so sort of gelatinous, jelly-like, and don't have a shell is to allow a lot of growth within that egg. They're stretchy. So when this amphibian hatches, they are huge. And rather than get bigger and bigger, the bulk of their body actually kind of shrinks down. So there's a lot of fat to be absorbed in the tail. That's one reason our amphibians do start off with a big fat tail. It helps to sustain them in that early life. Um, but as you can see, like the legs are not that huge. They're really about the size of those adult legs. So they're actually going to look like they're shrinking as they are growing. Really kind of an unusual creature that you wouldn't think would be able to exist. The next slide I show you is somebody that's actually gotten very popular in pop culture. I've seen a few um, children, grandchildren, they're in Minecraft. They'll tell you all about that. Um, these are an aquatic salamander called an axolotl. The one on the left, the greenish gray one, is the color they'd be in the wild where they'd camouflage beautifully. The one on the right you would see in captivity. They've been bred into all different colors, shades, patterns in captivity. Um, but aside from just sort of looking unusual, they have a couple traits that set them apart. They keep their features of being a larvae into adulthood. So thinking back to a frog, for example, we know they start off as a little tadpole. They grow those back legs. They keep they grow those front legs, but they still have that tail. And over time, that tail declines. So salamanders go through a similar process where they have these feathery looking gills at the side of their head. That's what those things are sticking out. 
And usually salamanders will lose those gills, that tail goes down and they move on to land. Not so much with, the, with these axolotls. They keep these larval features as they become adults. So they are the essentially tadpoles that never grow up. But you can actually force metamorphosis by exposure to certain hormones or certain extreme environmental conditions. They do look a little bit unusual if they metamorphose, metamorphize. So that's actually what they look like. Unfortunately, if they go through that change, they don't survive very long. Their natural state is to stay like those pictures at the top. So another thing that makes them so unusual is that they, like many amphibians, but just a little more, have great powers of regeneration. They actually can lose whole limbs and regrow muscle, skin, bones, everything multiple times. They have been known to lose whole parts of a skull and regenerate, even parts of an eye. So scientists like to know why that happens. There's a lot of research being done trying to figure out how this happens and how could we apply that you know, to our own purposes, to regrowing skin for burn victims, for example. So there's a lot of research going on in that direction right now. I hate to say it, they are almost extinct in the wild. They are down to one, possibly two lakes in Mexico. However, they are very widely bred in captivity. So you will see them in pet stores. Um, many people have them as pets. I happen to have two. <laughs> so um, not an easy animal necessarily to care for, but they are very interesting. Now, these last couple pictures, I've talked about the life cycle. So you look at this carefully and you might wonder if a tadpole hatches out of the egg, why am I seeing a little frog in the egg? So there's always multiple exceptions in nature. And we do have an exception, just one more thing that makes amphibians interesting. Some of them go through di direct development, meaning all those changes happen in the egg that by the time they hatch, little frog pops out. So many of our tropical frogs um, in rainforests around the equator go through this, rain frogs. The second picture I'm gonna show you, it's gonna look pretty strange. So we have a frog who clearly has another frog in its mouth. And this is a very unusual way to develop, but this is something called a gastric brooding frog. The frog will ingest her fertilized eggs and allow them to develop internally. Um, I am assuming at this time she does not really eat, um, but then essentially regurgitates her young when they are ready to go out into the world. So again, a very strange way of developing that we wouldn't anticipate. Now, this species in the picture actually did go extinct in 2002. There are some very similar species out there, but um, when we think about cloning, a lot of times scientists want to clone those animals who have gone extinct more recently versus something like a dinosaur. Um, Earth has changed a little bit too dramatically in most cases to bring back something from that time. However, something like this is considered a little bit more realistic of an animal to attempt to bring back. So there is some effort at doing that right now. These are those African clawed frogs that I talked about as possibly being one of the origins for chytrid fungus. Um, you may recognize them again from any pet store. They're an unusual frog in that they actually don't have a tongue. Usually when we think of how frogs feed, we think of that long sticky tongue. Frogs typically have that, toads not so much. Um, and in this case, they have no tongue whatsoever. So you can actually see it eating the way they do, actually using those hands sort of like little paddles to shove it into their mouth. And then one thing that you see with most frogs and toads is what's happening in this picture where he's kind of got one eye really smooshed down. You can see he's eating a nice big insect. But um, if you've ever watched a frog eat, one thing you'll notice is that they don't have their eyes wide open. Underneath their eyeballs are located some very, very strong muscles. So frogs actually use those muscles under the eyes to help push that food down the throat. So those eyes are actually pretty instrumental in helping them eat. Um, using that, they actually use their eye, eyeballs to swallow. So kind of gives you a little idea in so many ways of how different amphibians, frogs, for example, are from us. Um, breathing through their skin, uh, using their eyeballs to swallow, 
one thing I didn't mention, but I find interesting is that many species can freeze almost solid while they're underground waiting out the winter and then be fine in the spring. So I always, when I work with kids, say they have a lot of superpowers. <laughs> so I'm going to put up a list of some topics and sites where you can find some further information. Uh, of course, Pendixie, we do, other than fossils, have a lot of nature programs. So we may have some walks on our wetlands where you might be able to observe plenty of frogs and toads right now. Uh, we have bullfrogs um, croaking away right now. In the springtime, we do see thousands of tadpoles. The IUCN Red List is a great reference to see what kind of amphibians, what kind of animals or plants are actually on the endangered list and how endangered they are. Frog Watch USA is that citizen science program that I mentioned before. Um, if you ever are interested, say next spring, in taking part in one of those, that can help you find a branch that does that. The DEC is a good resource for local um, endangered animals, as well as more info on that amphibian arc. The book that I list on the bottom is a very um, easily accessible book. And I say that in the terms of it's not, you don't have to have a heavy science background to understand it. It's very well written for your average person. If you are or are not scientifically inclined, I think it's a, a decent book to get you a little bit familiar with some of the similarities that happen between different animals and us. So they do go through that whole evolution of those early um, Devonian fish to amphibians in this book. So if you wanted to expand on that a little bit further, I consider that a pretty good source. So I think we're gonna conclude my presentation at this point, but I'm hoping you have some good, um, good questions for me. I'm not hearing you, I think you're still muted. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Robin, that was really great. You are welcome. Uh, lots of good information about amphibians and their current situation. If anyone has questions, I can go, um, if you've called in, I can unmute you and you could ask a verbal question instead of typing it in the chat box. Let's see. Call in user, do you have a question? No, but the presentation was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, I appreciate you. it. <laughs> Okay. All right. So there we go. And Robin, this will be uploaded to our YouTube web page under Wonderful. University Express. Also on the back end of our University Express website. Very good. So thanks again. And we will, if we haven't already uh, sent you a form for the fall. Wonderful. We will send that and then you can be part of our fall semester too. Sounds great. All right. Thank you for having me today. All right, thanks so much. We'll talk on the other end, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, bye-bye.